I'm the manager of the internet project, uh, a co-host of this very special event. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, you could attend uh, this year. This is one of my favorite events, so I think I've been involved in it from almost the beginning. I, didn't, I wasn't involved in it very recently, but ever since then, I had the pleasure of hosting this event. Each year, the JW Grady Medal is awarded to an alumnus of the University of Waterloo, usually from the Faculty of Mathematics. In honor of this occasion, I guess the recipient has to uh, sing before he or she gets his medal. And uh, so this year we have again uh, a presentation by our medal recipient. The recipient this year is uh, Paul Van Orshot, and we're delighted that uh, he could attend uh, uh, or attend and give this presentation. And uh, in, in addition, uh, there are some special guests that are in attendance. And they include uh, Gary Waller, uh, associate provost from the University of Waterloo, Greg Barrett, who is the president of Unitech, uh, members from the JW Graham Medal Selection Committee, and they include Ian McPhee, Steve Brown, Gordon Cormack, Don Callan, and Bill Cunningham, who can't be here because his son is graduating, graduating from the University of Toronto. <laughs> okay, he'll so probably come to Waterloo afterwards. <laughs> um, and we are delighted that Paul's parents could be here, uh, Jack and Rita and our shop, and a special friend, Jen Small, as well. Um, we also have members of the Rita family. Jim and Ward Graham. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Don Town to introduce our speaker. You do get to hear the speaker, not just the introduction, by the way. <laughs> it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Paul Van Orschot. As you can see, he's Vice President and Chief Scientist in Trust Technology. And Trust started, I guess, in Nortel and spun out, gone from very, very small organization with two employees, about 800 employees now. Very large, very big in the security business. I think Paul, for as long as he was a lot of person, I guess, uh, Paul did his bachelor's, master's and PhD here. He won the KD Fryer Gold Medal. He was a varsity basketball player. Quite a good reputation to say the least. He was the team captain, most valuable player. Uh, recognized, I think you're in the Hall of Fame over there, aren't you? So he's a, both an outstanding academic, an outstanding scientist, an outstanding businessman, and an outstanding athlete. He's uh, a very disciplined individual, so I was just chatting with Paul a minute ago and reminding him that he would show up at meetings and he'd say, I'll be there at 12. He was there at 12. And he said, it'll be a half an hour meeting. And he left exactly at 12.30. He was exactly what had to be at home. And I'm sure that's got him, it's had a lot to do with getting him where he is today. Uh, Paul, of course, also holds, yeah, holds the record, but he's very close to the record for the fastest PhD of Waterloo. Uh, just for two years and one year. So most graduate students, they make it four, they're doing very well. Many of them love the life so much they never quite did. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul knew what he wanted to do and went for it. With those words, like welcome Paul, welcome home Paul. It's a quite a pleasure to be back here at one of the I think the last time I spoke here was 1991. And uh, I guess I didn't make much of an impression because it took nine years to invent that. This is a talk that you'll find it interesting. Uh, hope you'll learn a little bit. It's uh, not at all technical. And it's because I, I've done it in the past and I put up math slides and all that. And the talk. So hopefully you'll find it a bit enjoyable and uh, I'll be very happy to see. less than five years. It's really growing very, very, very rapidly. 
how many internet users do we have? Now, it's split across uh, predominantly in Canada and the US, about 40% of the people uh, use, use the internet drops off after your information and simply completes the program. But there's about 275 million people who now um, have access to the internet, and perhaps 150, 200 million of them through browsers. What kind of communication infrastructure do we have? Well, it, it started out with a fairly simple network where you have local employees and a network firewall and internet. Uh, through the internet or possibly through a dedicated high speed link. Then you have additional employees coming on, allocating to work from home, Salesforce, things that you have access to resources on your internal network. And it turns out you're actually successful and you have customers and partners. They want to get access from the network. And then uh, the last few years, especially wireless explosion. So there's been a tremendous evolution in our communications infrastructure. And uh, to go along with that, there's uh, some trends that have emerged. If we look at this chart and we look at uh, up the side, on the vertical scale, we have a level of security across the bottom of progressing over time. The dotted line uh, is kind of a rough indication of an acceptable level of security. And after people understood how many computers worked, um, everyone was quite comfortable with the level of security that they offered. And uh, just about that time, we introduced the PC, and the security dropped down quite rapidly. And then over time, it got ratcheted up. But then client server environments came in, and the security dropped again as the infrastructure got deployed. It's ratcheted up over time, and the web comes in. And then just when we're starting to understand web a bit, we have this distributed communication world with wireless devices and remote access. And the, um, the worrisome trend here is that the, the level of security that we get each time is decreasing. And what's really happening here is that people are so anxious to get uh, functionality, they want to get their job done, they want to make things available to people. That the, what's being sacrificed is the security. And today we have actually we didn't have any advertised problems, but uh, I think going forward we'll see there's a number of reasons why this has become much more center stage, particularly in the last year or two. So one of the things I want to highlight here related to security um, has to do with our banks. And I went through a couple of the statements, uh, the agreements that I could get my hands on. And I'm going to just read this first one here. This is for this is a client of this online terms. So you're trading your stocks online. And uh, if you read down that, it's somewhere around the world item seven, it says, I will also be liable for all fraudulent transactions made through the hmm. What exactly does that mean? I guess it means, I guess it's very good. So I thought, okay, but we looked at another one, this is an agreement for full and fast instructions. Um, and uh, my bank wanted me to sign this one because uh, that was their policy. And the first point that jumped out to me was this bank and the bank remains unnamed, although both of these um, are substantial institutions. They can act on instructions from, or purporting to be from, an authorized person. I, I asked my, my dad and I said, well, I mean, you don't actually expect me to sign this to you. And she said, well, there's no problem. I know who you are. <laughs> and I said, exactly. Why don't I need to sign this? And I, she said, well, if you don't sign this, you can't authorize any money to the account. So then I continued to read that. It says, all telephone and fax instructions as active, on the line, unnamed bank will be conclusively considered as valid, even if they did not come from an authorized person. <laughs> now, there's a little game going on. I'm supposed to sign this to go somewhere else. But these uh, two particular banks happen to be two of the, uh, basically, the five largest banks that we work with. They are also the only two that I checked. So, and this is the current state of risk. Now, is this something that's reason? Well, I think, I think it is, because uh, on the next slide here, um, I think you've got an idea as to how, um, what is, how much insurance you actually have on the internet by default. And the caption says, 
on the internet, nobody knows your dog. <laughs> so this is quite an old, uh, an old cartoon, but um, this is actually a true stat. It's from a distance when you deal with people you haven't met before. You have no idea. The great thing about the internet is it levels the playing field. Someone's at a browser and they click and they're on your web page and you have the full thing everyone else gets to display one page at a time. The problem is uh, you have no more or less confidence by default uh, unless you put a security protection in place then well, you basically have no assurance of it at all. So it's, it's actually fun but it's, it's quite serious. And the real trick today is that we want and we need to have an environment which is truly open to third so that the people that want to communicate and that want to make information available to be get. So these are our employees, the main reason they are suppliers and partners, and also our customers. Uh, and at the same time, we don't want our competitors to get into that information. Some of it will be publicly available, but other information about our products we don't want competitors to have. And then there are other individuals or, or organizations uh, that don't have much good in society, and we don't want them to have access or to be able to disrupt their The real questions uh, that arise are who is authorized to get access to what information or what resources? Is it data that's transmitted uh, across communication lines or stored in databases or on servers? Is that protected? And if you carry those transactions, do you have receipts the same way that you have receipts in the physical world right now? That if there's a problem, you can go back and say, this is what I did, and something went wrong. Are there a lot of people that are wrong records? So those are the questions. And sure enough, I guess they knew that there was going to be something about public key on the side. And uh, public key actually uh, provides a technical solution to these problems. And the technical solution is through encryption and digital signatures. And there's a number of things that you can build on top of those uh, primitives. So public key crypto solves that, uh, that basic problem, but it's a technical problem. But if you're actually trying to deploy uh, commercial systems, uh, one of the things about the internet that you have to confront is the scale. People want to get out of money quickly. And they also typically want the potential to scale. So you know, there are organizations with 10,000, 100,000 people. There are also businesses that are run websites that expect millions of people to be coming in and some subset of those millions of people to be customers. So uh, in order to actually deploy the property, the problems that you run into, you have to do with what's called key management managing the cryptographic keys that is uh, the core of the security. And binding users' digital identities, their names, the binding rules to credentials. And this is where public key infrastructure comes into place. And the idea of public key infrastructure is that it automates the management of these public keys, of the corresponding private keys, I'll talk about that a bit more in a And it automates the management of what are called digital certificates. So those are the best analogy really is um, a bit of oversimplification, is that they're electronic passports. You know, people have talked about them as you know, driver's license for the, for the web sort of thing. But there is a pretty good analogy uh, between a digital certificate and an electronic passport. And the public infrastructure is what um, makes the management of these um, transparent to the users and uh, automates them. So the real idea of public key infrastructure is that it's a, uh, a central infrastructure that is used across a wide array of applications. Uh, and the applications can range from email security to 100 desktop one and there's files and folders. Uh, if you're on your cell phone and you want the communication to be secured. Uh, you have, uh, if you're doing web browsing, you want that connection to be secure, uh, what are called virtual file networks. Uh, you would like, ideally, to have each one of these individually secure, um, but better than that, we don't actually want to have to enter a password and remember 15 different passwords for 15 different applications. You know, maybe the words carry 15 different hardware to their smart cards. So at the core, the idea of public infrastructure is a single infrastructure which can be used for as many of these as possible. You're probably going to have more than um, the one password. And if we can reduce this and get a reduced volume, um, that actually simplifies people's lives. Uh, you can also think 
how about public infrastructure as something that manages uh, keys for encryption and digital signatures. But another way of looking at it is as an identity infrastructure. If you can basically tell who you're talking to, you can then build on top of that and put an authorization infrastructure, what we call it, a privilege infrastructure, on top of that. But in order for those to work, you really have to know who you're dealing with. And so uh, I guess people now see a public infrastructure as the basis on which to build uh, further services. And a few more details on, uh, on what a digital certificate is here. It's, uh, it's a data structure which has a number of different uh, fields in it. The, uh, the top field gives a subject name, the owner of the certificate. There's a serial number that you can identify. It's kind of like a credit card and then it has an expiry, a start and stop date, expiry date. And then there's something called a public key. And that's just a, a string of numbers, a string of bits that has the right mathematical properties as well, the magic of crypto work. And the main point about this certificate is that there's a subject name and there's a public key. And through this guarantee at the bottom of the certificate, that public key is bound to that name. And so here, the city of Waterloo is, uh, is the issuer of the certificate, so they issue it. And what that means is that they are the ones that put that, that ribbon on the bottom, and that's um, representing a digital certificate itself, a digital signature itself. And the city of Waterloo is guaranteeing that this is the public key that belongs to this individual. Now, I mentioned the idea of um, automated management of certificates, and you think that this is quite, um, you know, it gives a certificate you wish you had done, but it turns out that there's a lot more things involved. In order for the rest of our security infrastructure to be built upon the certificate, we have to actually have an assurance that that individual is the main individual. And so there's some sort of registration phase where someone here shows up in person, or based on pre shared information, you know that you're actually dealing with that authentic person. And so there's a registration And the certificate is issued. In order for the certificate to be issued, that public key having it generated generated the process of the mathematical properties. Now there's a corresponding private key, and the private key can be used for encryption and decryption. Typically, you may well want to back that private key up so that in case you're, you're just crashing, maybe not some sort of a software failure, you can actually recover um, the encrypted information. If you, once you issue a certificate, the individual that that certificate belongs to needs to get a copy. But also, anyone else that you want to rely upon that needs to use that certificate for some of this application needs to get access to it. Every time they use the certificate, it's like a credit card. You, know, you call it in to find out whether it's still valid. And there's a certificate validation process that goes on, and so there's associated information for that process. And again, there's a good analogy here with credit cards. Super credit cards can get revoked before their normal expiry period. And so every time you use a certificate, you want to check if the signature on the bottom is correct. You want to check if the validity period is it, still, you're still within the validity period. And you want to check if it hasn't yet been revoked. Uh, then there's a, a point in time where, like credit cards, again, the certificate will expire. Maybe it's issued for a year, maybe it's issued for a day. But it's expired, and you need to, well, possibly, if you want to destroy the private key so that it's no longer available to people, which uh, is a signature key. You may need to archive some information for future use, monitor all information. And then you need to generate a new key pair and get this going again. And ideally, you would like to avoid that initial registration step here, because that turns out to be the most costly step in deploying large-scale infrastructures, is getting individuals registered. So you want to have an automated and transparent way of updating that, and you like software to do this, so the end users are not impacted at all. Um, so let me step back here again. Um, this is probably as technical as slide as you can see, but so everyone's on the same page. What are, what are we doing with encryption? On one end, we have some information uh, we have some uh, process we call encryption, uh, information that's encrypted, and the other end gets decrypted and recover the original information. To do this with symmetric encryption, we use a key, a key that's the same numbers, a secret number, 
how. And with symmetric encryption, the idea here is that you use the same key, both for encryption and decryption. The best analogy, the analogy I have best, is it's like a dead uh, dead will lock the key. And so you turn the key to lock it. You have to use the same key to unlock it. You don't do exactly the same thing and maybe you turn the camera clock or whatever it was. But that's, that's symmetric encryption. And this is a use both for uh, transmitting data and also for storing data. One of the problems is these days have to be a lot of press um, websites have servers. There's customer information on the servers. One particular person can serve things like credit card numbers. Uh, when it gets into the server database, the credit card numbers are made available. So you'd like the server information while it's stored to be encrypted. Okay, so um, usually people walk away from clocks not remembering anything at all. So I'm hoping that you'll remember one thing and it'll be this too. Um, if you have a, a symmetric cipher, kind of like the way that we define a strong cipher is if it's strong, then there's no shortcut attack. So the best way to defeating it is to try all possible means. If you think about a combination lock, um, you know, short of actually you know, cutting, the, cutting the lock, if it's a strong lock, the best way should be to try all possible combinations and eventually it'll be open. But you want the number of combinations to be so large that that's an infeasible task. So one of the algorithms that's been used for a long time, for about 20 years, um, it's still in modern use, but now it's considered uh, very much on the low end of the period of the benefit of the network of the record, is that it does have the 56 bit key. 56 zeros and ones is, is the secret number. And we have a problem. We, we can't conceive of how big these numbers are. I mean, how big is it? How long would it take to, to go through that many keys? And so the picture here is imagine that you're in winter and uh, you're on the highway, and we're going to actually add some lanes to the highway. You're going to add lanes across, so it's two kilometers wide. And then we're actually going to put some side barriers up, and it's going to raise up and maybe some walls that about two kilometers high. And then we're going to look at this line, you're going to drive all the way to Montreal. Okay, that's about 900 kilometers. And uh, we're going to actually extend the wall all the way up there. And now we have a volume that, on the face, is two square kilometers. We're going to put golf balls in this entire volume, and pack them as high as we can. Okay? And um, every, so every inch of the way, imagine you're walking along, every inch you step along, there's a two kilometer wall of golf balls packed tight. Okay? But you're not going to be walking, you're actually going to be driving. You're going to be driving for nine hours, and there's going to be all these golf balls. That is 2 to the 56. That's how many golf balls would fit in that volume. And your task in order to actually break the cipher is as these balls are going by your time, is to find one golf ball that is a little bit heavier than all the other ones. So that's, that's how they do the 56 digits. Now, the very surprising thing is 72 per drill. Okay? So the surprising thing is that that can actually be done by computer. Not, not actually the golf ball. But you can actually search. <laughs> search 256 keys, and it turns out that with 1,000 keys, uh, it would take about three months. Or if you build the right machine, um, you could, for one million dollar for machine, and not for about 15 months. So that's a big number, and we can actually do that. So that's scary to it. Um, so therefore, most modern ciphers actually use keys that are much longer, 128 bits is quite standard. And it turns out that there's no, if these are strong cycles, the best way to defeat these is actually to, uh, to go through 128, to the 128 uh, exhaustive search. That'll never happen. Uh, if you want to understand how much bigger to the 128 is than to the 56, we're going to multiply two together, you know, another uh, 56 times plus 16. Uh, imagine all those golf balls that you were driving by or walking by or whatever, now your task is for each one of those golf balls, you have to search another corridor equal to that original corridor, 900 miles, for every single one. And then, after you're done, of course you never have to be, you still have to 
talk to that 65,000 lines. So, the 128 number we don't have to worry about, but hopefully this gives you some idea as to uh, the fact that there are strong sectors. We have no worry about the cryptography percentage. In practice, it's typically implementations or other um, system flaws that break down, not actually encryptionality in the cryptography. Okay, so this talk actually is about public key technology. And the thing that changes with public key technology is that we now actually have not the same key as the encryption decrypt, we have a pair of keys. And this, this pair of keys has some nice mathematical problems that have to be of interest in mathematicians, but no one else. And, <laughs> and these keys, um, if you think about public key very much as, well, think about a combination lock. Uh, so this is an analogy. The, the lock design is like the triple system the algorithm is using. The combination of the combination lock is the key. The, uh, anyone, if I give you a moment of lock, anyone can close the lock and lock it up, right? That's like encrypting something from someone. And only the person who knows the course of my key can open. So that's a good analogy. You can also think about this as, uh, think about the public phone book. I can look up your phone number in the public phone book. And that's a publicly available number. If I call that number, presumably only the right person can call because they're the one who has the cell phone or who has, is sitting at home and answers that phone. So the public key is the phone number, the private key is like the ability to answer that phone. All right, now related to encryption, we're often talking about the same record this concept of the digital signature. This is very important. In fact, as I was driving on the Coastal Department this morning to the radio, uh, there was a mention that the, um, in the U.S., the, uh, the House has just passed the uh, digital signature bill, and it's down to the Senate, so I'll talk more about that later. But the idea of a uh, digital signature is you have a message, and what you do is you append to it a signature, except here the signature is also a string of numbers or a string of this, which depends on some secret information, the private key, and also depends on the message itself. The, um, the person who is the signer is the only one who can read that, because they're the only one who knows the private key. Once we hand the signature to someone, uh, any other party who has the other public key is able to actually verify whether or not that signature matches that document. If it does match, then they have confidence that the, the owner of that public key the person who's made on that certificate actually was the person who signed it. And the reason this is important in practice right now is that you have a commitment on an electronic transaction. And one of the things that people are hoping for is that this can really reduce the paperwork a lot and even complex transactions can be signed on the line. So let me go back and make here a bit of a, a, a history recap. Um, if you look back, there's a little bit after 1976 that, uh, that Diffie and Hellman had invented public key cryptography. Ralph Merkel also had uh, a lot of the early ideas. He was coming out of the problem a little bit differently. Um, he was an important early player. But where Bess and Shemir and Edelman, about two years later, they invented the first practical instantiation of a uh, public encryption and digital signature system. And this was based on a factoring problem. Uh, about six years later, Helen Wall invented uh, another crypto system. This was based on a different mathematical uh, problem, but basically allowed you to do both digital signatures and digital description. Then about a year later, uh, Neil Bullis and Victor Miller, um, they proposed the idea of the current cryptography, which is actually a, another way of implementing uh, the discrete log crypto system. As a side note, uh, with defeat, Joe Wayne uh, Bell wrote research, um, which is a, a theory of Bill uh, shortly after he um, uh, invented public key cryptography. And actually, I had the pleasure of working with him up until 1991 or so. He was with Nortel. And so that was actually very helpful to me early on in my career. So, what else do we have here? Oh, some other historical perspective here. What has happened to all these great inventions we're going on? Well, in 1978, I was in grade 11, and I was doing this thing called data processing. We had to fill out these punch cards. Actually, that's why it wasn't punch cards. It was the uh, one that had to fill in with an HP lead pencil all the way through. So 
This was after the public speaker talked to us in Oh, 1980. I took a course here in Waterloo. That's the first year. <laughs> John Cowan. And uh, Don, uh, Don was uh, way ahead of me as usual with the here. Um, in fact, back in 1980, he was already teaching people cobalt so that uh, 20 years later, in the late 90s, these people could make millions of dollars. <laughs> and there were some days actually when when the course material was, was too boring even for Don. And he didn't show up. And uh, that was the first time that, that I met Wes Graham. Because I think Wes had the sister course, and once in a while I did trade courses. And so I had the pleasure of, of learning with Wes the first year and before I uh, went on to work with the assistant group. So in uh, 1981, I was employee number five of Wat Bong. And uh, the museum to be here. Right, and I thank him for uh, giving me a lot of inspiration early on. It was very, it was very important, and uh, uh, I think I learned an awful lot uh, that first year and thereafter. So I'd like to thank you for everything you've done. You've helped a lot of other people in this community. So, thank you. Um, what else? Oh, 1983. <laughs> Assets, 
It's just the navigator, the navigator. Um, in late, in August of 1995, that's the uh, and uh, other companies in the business here, Security Dynamics acquired RSA Data Security uh, sometime in 1996. Uh, they're assigned Block Network Solutions just recently. And uh, also in the first half of this year, Microsoft has shipped their first version of the PPI in Windows 2000. And Microsoft gets the data to know that um, uh, product segment is real. And so this is kind of, we see it as, we see it as really um, helping the whole market a lot because it's legitimizing it. And um, it's a lot easier. Uh, there's a lot less education you need to have because Microsoft is telling people what all the particular structure is. You have to do a lot less teaching. Okay, so the company itself, um, how have we done? From 1995, we started with a revenue of $4 million less, and last year we had a revenue of $85 million. So we did um, as successful as we could have hoped to be. In terms of market share, um, this is a statistic from Gartner Group. Data press in August of last year, we have we're the leading the leader in market share in the PPI city. Now some of those other companies, Netscape, uh, of course, has been absorbed now. You might not recognize Baltimore just recently also bought GT Cybertrust, some of you may have heard of their airline. Perhaps none of these are very familiar names to you, but let me mention that one of these companies now has a market capitalization of $32 billion. Uh, what does that mean? Well that's twice as big as BC Incorporated, or three times as big as the Canadian Bureau Bank of Commerce. And this is after the markets have fallen. <laughs> so there's some companies that are around, certainly, uh, some people think they're important. Um, okay, so how do browsers actually work? Well, there's a certification authority that's handy that creates your signed and digital certificates. And the browsers automatically trust certificates which are issued by a, a collection of so-called root CAs. And these are CAs which have their certificates or their public keys um, built into the browser, so you can say the big. So what happens? You visit a website, and uh, what happens is that the website sends back to you its public key certificate. So now your browser is sitting with this certificate, and the browser checks whether this certificate is signed by one of the CAs for which there is a certificate a key built into the browser. If it finds a, a match of CA, it checks the signature, checks, uses the public key, checks whether the certificate is valid, checks whether it's within the proper date, and if it is, it says, okay, now I trust this certificate. I trust this is the connection to the main party. And if the public key in that certificate, the public key on the server, and you then use that public key to create a secure session with the server. And basically what that means is that we can use that and all the, the graphic algorithms that we don't want to talk about and end up securing this. We I mean, can think about it as a pipe. Thereafter, all the communications sent between the browser and the server are secured by this company. OK, so uh, <laughs> transitions like this. Why is it that we think that um, that security and public infrastructure is why that they really are on the front page now. And there's a number of reasons, I'm going to go through four or five of them, a number of reasons that the deployment of security infrastructures is going to accelerate at a much more rapid pace even than the past couple of years. One of them has to do with um, digital signature legislation. In the United States, 46 out of 50 states actually have state electronic signature laws. And the Senate and the House are about to recognize electronic signatures. Potentially, Clinton will sign off on this bill next Tuesday. And the basic idea here is to give the same legal weight to electronic signatures, and the preferred method will be digital signatures, to give them the same legal weight as the handwritten signature. And once you give them the same legal weight, that will shift much more business onto these electronic forms. Wherever that can save you time. Sometimes it will save you time, sometimes it will. But this will be a huge driver for the electronic commerce. So look, look for that next week in the newspaper. Um, here in Canada, back in April, we passed Bill C6. And this does the same thing. It gives the force of a lot of signatures. There's a second part of Bill C6, which basically mandates the protection 
uh, sensitive personal data, and so by law you're now required to do that, uh, and then we have an ombudsman that will look into these sorts of issues. And over time, we will ratchet up the requirement for protection of personal data. Uh, once there are laws in place, things get much more serious. Um, another issue here in the United States, there is this act called HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This was published in the Federal Register August two years ago. And the idea of this legislation is uh, to improve, we can read it here, the efficiency and effectiveness of the healthcare system by encouraging the establishment of standards and requirements for the electronic transfer of certain healthcare information. And they're basically mandating which you have to take proper care of when you store or transfer healthcare records. And there are a large number of bodies, especially more so in the states, where there's different organizations involved in the healthcare system that transfer records. Uh, what HIPAA is really is a roadmap for using public infrastructure and the related privilege management to optimization infrastructure to run top of that. There's a rule that we know by which the healthcare organizations have to comply with this law, and we see that also as a huge driver for public infrastructure. Another phenomenon that you've no doubt read of in the past year has been this idea of trading networks or exchanges, and there's several different kinds of exchanges. Um, some are closed trading networks, some are what are called vertical or specialty trading networks, some are open, network, open networks. The real idea here, and, and I've used that as an example, the Reba, one of the big companies in the scope, is the Reba network, is you have buyers on one side, suppliers on the other side. The suppliers are make available information regarding what's available for sale, the buyers are the buyer. When you're asked to want to carry a transaction, when you complete a transaction, well, all of a sudden security becomes important because you need to have a transaction payment infrastructure in place, you need to have receipts in case things go wrong, or corrections. And all of these exchanges that have been put in place require security. Um, we're even another company, some of you may not have heard of. Market capitalization of Ariba is bigger than the World Bank of Canada. Uh, one other field here, the topic is digital rights management, and we have a lot of press about this as well. People who own digital property or intellectual property in the form of digital information, such as um, movies, such as uh, music, they're very concerned about how they're going to maintain control of this information. And one of the ways that's emerged to have this control is you encrypt the content, you encrypt the movie or the song, and then you assign certain rights associated with, with this object. And the encryption key itself, you release it only to someone who comes in and authenticates himself. And when they authenticate themselves, that's your chance to track them to authorize. Maybe you're charging them for a visit, or maybe you're just checking to see that they paid you ahead of time to have a subscription basis. So um, public infrastructure is a natural solution to solve this digital rights management problem and um, the applications for both in the business to consumer space and in the business to business space. Um, one of the other huge revolutions here in the past three years has been the explosion of wireless and this wireless application protocol uh, is receiving a lot of attention. So that is a worldwide suite of standards for efficient delivery of internet communication and information services to mobile devices. So there's a lot of standards form that's receiving participation from all the wireless infrastructure players. And they're basically rewriting all of the, the protocols that are used in the wireline network for the web in order to meet the constraints of the wireless network. So if we take a look at the wireless, at the existing web architecture, on the left hand you have a browser, and over a standard internet connection, you're connecting up to a web server. That's really at the front, providing you a connection interface. Typically, if you run an application, you find that there's an application server, and yet behind that, there's a back-end system that maybe has your, for the application, the web server, think about it, the page that you visit when you do the website. The application server, think about that as your online bank and brokerage application. The back-end system is a system maybe that has your own database, it's records of, uh, how much money you have in which accounts that you pay your users. 
That gets down to onto the, onto the, the wireless architecture. We have the application server is now sent to my wireless server, and the link from the wireless server up to the handheld device to the wireless plants um, is over wireless network. There's new protocols involved in that phase of this architecture. And on your smartphone here, you actually have um, increasingly what's known as a micro-path and more and more information available on the web will be available in the simplified form on these reduced real estate screens. Uh, so another simple look here at the uh, security architecture for wireless. This is what's called the 1.1 architecture. Again, the same picture on the left-hand side, you've got your wireless device. There's an over-the-air link. Uh, wireless TLS is a wireless version of uh, TLS or SSL. SSL is a secure socket layer, and they changed the name to TLS because too many people actually started to know what SSL stood for. So <laughs> it's called TLS now. And so there's a gateway function now, and the gateway then is a front end which hooks you up to a web server. That's the web server that has your information. That's using an existing TLS connection, and one of the problems with this architecture the 1.1 one version is to encrypt information on your cell phone at the gateway has to be decrypted and then re-encrypted for the other server um, on the right hand side. Of course, that means that the gateway all the information is there. Not a particularly good uh, situation to be in if you worry about getting the information through to the server. So the later versions of the lab architecture and capital design take care of that and allow you to uh, end and execute. Um, but when you add security in, what you need to have is you have certificate infrastructure. And uh, so what I have here on the right hand again is there's a, an SSL server certificate. So that's a certificate. So the server on the right can, can offer that certificate to the WAP gateway when the WAP gateway makes that connection. The WAP gateway itself, in this instance, it's actually a client to that server. It makes a connection and it needs an SSL client certificate. You get a mutual authentication between the lab gateway and the server. Now, if you move to the left end of the picture, the lab gateway itself is a server to the router, and so it needs to have a server certificate to deliver to the cell phone when you visit it. And the cell phone, what it needs to have is it needs to be able to verify that certificate or to trust that certificate, so it needs to have that integrated. Uh, a root key that allows it to verify the signature on the certificate that's delivered to it. So the delivery of those certificates and the installation of that root key is part of the infrastructure, uh, adding security to the wireless environment. And you can make it available any that the certification authority that generates these certificates. And for if you want to facilitate this to ordinary browsers, you put up what's called a PKI portal. These browsers visit the portal and deliver the certificates that we have. Here's one slide on um, another application. This is an online environment. We've done some work with, with RIM here in town. And of course, they have the, the Blackberry Pager. This is an interesting experiment I'd like to have. How many rows do we have to go before we get someone with the Blackberry Pager? Anyone in the first row, third row? Back of the calendar. Um, so, what happens here? Um, um, I'm at desktop one, and I want to send an email message to my colleague Ron, who actually works two hours down from me in Ottawa. And he's, uh, he's desktop two here, he's a whole team of PCs. We use, um, we use Microsoft Exchange, so the way this email message actually gets sent is when I send it, that is if I say send, it actually of course goes straight to Ron's PC, it goes to the server, and then the server sends it to his machine. Or next time he logs in, pulls it down from the server. So that's what happens here. Um, but it turns out that Ron actually has a blind pager, and he's out of the office right now, he likes to be receiving his uh, email while he's traveling. And we have a little application money that well, my send of this email was encrypted. We actually sent all of our official email encrypted. So, a piece of software running on this PC decrypts this message, and that's using uh, public key cryptography for the encryption decryption, and sends a message over to uh, another piece of software running on this PC, which does 
triple bit encryption, re encrypts it with a symmetric key, and then sends out the finger to the to a wireless carrier, which is part of the rhythm that gets sent out to fingers. And so this is the way that we've incorporated the BlackBerry feature to secure bandwidth with an existing uh, office environment. As we go forward, one of the real challenges will be to deploy more and more of these wireless appliances which have uh, security that is consistent with the existing infrastructure. And ideally all of these um, all of these wireless appliances will have public key crypto built into them so that they can do uh, signature transactions on the handset. Uh, so just to wrap up here, um, a couple of reflections. Um, it's kind of scary, but it was, it was 20 years ago that I started at Waterloo. So um, I don't think anyone needs to be missing of that. It's, it's really incredible. I think about 20 years ago, the most um, the most breathtaking thing to me about technology was that, of course, we used it was a that time. So the most surprising thing there was towards the system actually it was kind of bad for the system one that you did. You'd be in Q position 23, and I would say you'd be in Q position 37. But that was that was breathtaking back then. Things have things have moved on. Now technology crystallizes rapidly. Okay. I mean, there's a big build-up, but we think all of a sudden things have happened. What's happened is behind the lines, you know, people have been working very hard um, to get a lot of things going. But once they're too successful, all of a sudden people say, wow, what's happened in three months? You know, back, back in the early 80s, people were telling me that public decryptography was just around the corner. This is going to be next year, it's going to be a big boom. And it turns out that we, from my perspective, what actually triggered the boom with public decryptography was around 95 when Netscape built SSL into their browser. All of a sudden, basically within a couple of months, we had 40 million people that had on their desktop software that could process digital certificates. Within three months, we went to telling customers, uh, this is what public decryptography is, this is what a certificate is. What certification authority is to um, us saying this is what is going on. We all want that stuff. We got that big power. It was just boom. And but there was a lot of work that went into cryptography before that point of time. Then it kind of crystallized. Um, so this is this is a thought that um, that really strikes me that we if you if you know someone who thinks, if you hear someone speak clearly, that typically means they think clearly. If you read something that's written well, that's usually a sign that someone's not well. If someone's explaining something to you and you don't understand it, that's actually their problem. So there's really no substitute for clearly thinking. If you can surround yourself with people who you can understand, then you're doing very well for yourself. And you should recognize these people and give them credit. Um, one of the ways in which we're blessed in this field is that a number of the early papers, Diffie and Hellman, Gresham and Mary Hellman, uh, Marty Hellman and some other papers, you can go back and read them now, papers from like them. They're exceptionally clear. These people knew what they were doing. Um, I don't know if they knew how successful it would be now or what they thought would happen earlier, but the papers are very useful. Doing it is different than um, I think it's important. Uh, doing it is different. And typically when you do something, you start to really understand the problem. And you get to a second and third level of understanding what the true issues are. Without doing something, you never get to that level. And uh, coupled with this thought is experience. You know, when we're younger, we think of experience, experience, you know, I'll get there. You learn things through experience. And that's one of the things that I you now give people a lot of credit when I uh, know that they've done something before I have to ask them for their experience because there's no sense in duplicating for me. Uh, people skills. Exceptionally important, and I'm thinking about my, my work environment now, exceptionally important and too often neglected. The people that are that are poor communicators end up not being able to communicate very important ideas. They are, it doesn't matter how important their ideas are, you can't share them. You're not, you're not really helping very many people. And um, this is one of the things that I went back 
uh, a final back at um, what we can do to change the system. As, as important as I think technology is and learning technical things, uh, in the technical university programs, I think we have to emphasize uh, the other skills uh, much more, communication skills, keyword skills, and some of the so-called soft skills. Uh, these are just so important when you're actually trying to work in a team environment. And I, uh, it's hard to teach people things that are not interested in learning, but uh, I think we should give some thought to what we can do there. Um, appreciate rich environments. Um, most people who have gone to school here at Waterloo have no idea what, how rich an environment this is until they leave. And then you talk to people from other universities and you realize um, what the careers are. You also see what the environments are in the working world. Um, this is truly a rich environment. If you're in a different environment, appreciate what this is written about that environment. Don't take these things for granted. Um, it's those of you who are students who have an optical find essential. The last point, uh, challenge yourself. Um, it's up to you to challenge yourself. Uh, don't think that that's anyone else's responsibility. And when you do have successes, large and small, take the time to congratulate yourself and to realize that those are your successes. Uh, so let me just read this around. There's a toaster there, there's some toaster in. I don't know how it happened. There's an app with a toaster in some guy in Norway. He's very good. All right, so uh, as we're finishing up here, a screenshot of a, a lack of us, a screen which demonstrated in 1999. It includes a uh, surveillance camera, uh, key out attachments, weather housing, and uh, many other things I'm sure. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to us today. I'll take questions. I think the less information that you can put into a certificate, 
relating to authorization, the more useful that certificate is going to be for a broad range of applications. Two parts. Um, when 56-bit DES was invented, was it believed to be secure forever? Uh, it was, uh, so the history there was, uh, the, 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 the call that went out from the U.S. government, and there were proposals. Uh, DES was submitted by IBM, originally on the 64-bit cycle, and it got knocked down to 56-bits. There was argument as to whether or not the government was intentionally weakening at that point. Now, the papers came out shortly thereafter, which basically said, uh, within 20 years, this will be crackable. And it was actually, they weren't far off. Now, and so, early on, people believed that its useful lifetime would be at most 20 years because the land was likely 18 months, you know, the, the speed doubles. Um, so you, you can break these things quite well. Um, so, I'll just add to that by repeating 128 bits. Um, you know, we believe now will be secure, and the people that looked at this, they're, they're, they're the best in the industry. When it was 56 bits, they said it won't be secure 20 years from now. 128 bits, they say right now 90 bits would be both equivalent to 56 bits back then. 90 bits is probably good for 20 years. Uh, if you have 128, you're all free. Second part, second part is uh, how much online transactions do you personally conduct? <laughs> well, I'm 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 well, I, uh, let me say that, that I, um, I like using the telephone and meeting in person with people, and that I do a whole lot less after I bring these agreements. <laughs> There's another slide you haven't mentioned, which is people who issue the certificates and control the system. There is a big brother uh, sort of hint that they can use that position in negative ways. Uh, in a sense, uh, maybe just clarify what you mean for. I'm not sure I understand what they can do, but. Those who control the system or issuing certificates have considerable additional powers over right? well, what you do with that certificate. They can watch you, they can, they can find information on what you do with it. Okay, well let me, uh, let me take a stab at the addressing. So the question is whether the people who issue certificates actually have some power which can in some way be abused. Well, anyone, uh, you know, you can issue all the certificates you want. Um, at the end of the day, you're not in any use unless someone is reliant on that certificate. So when you think about a reliant party for a certificate, the user, uh, the person who's supplying it. And that, by, by default, why should I trust any certificate? It's issued by someone, it's signed by someone, I don't trust it. And so the whole question is, what, who's, which CAPs or which issuers am I delivering my trust to? And if I'm a, an enterprise organization, our organization can decide to run phone infrastructure. And for uh, applications within that business, it's fine. If you're, um, if you're uh, a government and you would like to issue certificates so that people can file their tax returns, then you know, that may well be a useful uh, thing to do. Now, if you're worried about some central authority having private keys that can somehow get access to information that any user can encrypt, that's a separate question. And we can talk about who should be backing up keys, if anything, in a long debate about that sort of thing. And uh, the governments and the law enforcement agencies have been suggesting that they should be the holder of the keys. They basically leap down and not. Um, but, but there definitely is a reason why commercial environments you do want to back up the key so that if you lose your own key, you know, you actually can acquire your data. I don't know if that's the type of thing you're getting at. But you can't basically choose who you're going to trust. Or if you're involved in some, if you're going to a bank, the bank may say, you will trust it if you get by the bank. You get to choose. I want to agree with that or I want to know what it is that's on the road. You mentioned uh, a few applications, there's a whole myriad of applications for PPI and the sort of at the beginning phase of that. Um, for example, yesterday, Mike Lesnar just had a community talk event talking about the electronic wallet. 
and so forth. But maybe you can entertain this for some of the more unusual or far out applications, perhaps, which are the key categories. Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think we'll end up seeing is that uh, it hasn't taken off here as much here as over here, but the idea of having cell phones uh, and now these cell phones on larger screens, these will become our personal trust agents. And um, there are already been demonstrations here in Africa, um, in Europe, where you walk up to a, a Coke machine and you buy a Coke with your cell phone. And it shows up, the, you know, the, the 75 cents shows up on your phone bill. And they you know, go in and route that and walk away. So that's the sort of thing that we can imagine. And your handheld device will, you know, currently, you walk in when you do a debit card transaction, you have to, uh, to swipe the card or whatever you do. But you'll end up, why should you trust someone else's terminal? You'll walk into a store, you actually trust the piece of hardware that you carry in yourself, and you will sign, you'll have to walk in and sign transactions and commit to them with your cell phone rather than relying upon other terminals. You, you won't even want to take your smart card into another piece of hardware because you don't want that smart card to try to right? So, where are some data coming from? What do you think about the concern that we had so few uh, certain authorities or trusted certain authorities that in one compromise that would uh, undermine the entire public right. So the question is, what can you do about the situation where because there are so few certification authorities or right, institutions that are going to be able to call the that will destroy the trustable system? Now, it turns out that there are only large, there's a couple of very large um, uh, public CA services. Um, but if you look in your browser and you go into the right security tabs, you'll actually find that in, for example, Internet Explorer 5, there's over 100 certificates. Pre-made into it. In fact, you trust a lot of them. That's the model that we're working with here. But um, if one or two of them go down, everyone who relies on those one or two, which may be a large community, will go down. But more and more, I think you will see different business exchanges, the Yellow Roof Exchange, the uh, pharmaceutical exchanges, Chemex, different industry companies will set up their own trust structures and they will issue their own certificates. Uh, appropriate for that community of trust. And there will be systems built in where if a particular certification authority is compromised, it gets revoked, and a new certificate can be generated for new keys. So you have to have redundancies built in, um, and you have to make sure that you don't have all of your confidence in just one state. Because there's no guarantee that any one of these isn't going to fall. I mean, it could be through any rating. Nothing is open. You also have to trust the, uh, the browser is, the built-in uh, browser certificates are valid for trust. Right, so this is, this is one of the issues with the current browsers that we have. You as an end user, you know, comes to ship to you pre-configured to trust all these keys. You can manually go in and delete all of these keys if you want. It turns out that we see for many like, commercial applications, uh, customers are not happy with that particular trust model. And the, the browser manufacturers do provide tools that allow you to rip all of those keys out before you distribute the internet. But if you just go to Microsoft's website, we can figure trust model. So, you know, if you're actually using these for significant business transactions, be very careful what analyze when we think of these as trust model questions. And therefore, Back. Like, so the, the mathematical model behind all the security systems is very solid, but a problem a lot of this stuff is being implemented in software, and the way software is being pushed out in the industry now is getting pretty fast, and a lot of the problem with security is actually in the implementation, it's not actually in the math. So is there anything being done in the industry that you're seeing to try to kind of like get certification for implementation? Right. So the question is, is the observation that uh, a lot of the problems, most of the problems actually, don't occur as a result of the graphic algorithm. The results from implementation, soft implementations, and implementation plot do it increasingly softly and shift faster and faster. Um, basically, if you're using software, you have to trust your software manufacturer. And uh, there are you know, some companies uh, specialize 
in mass market products and some companies specialize in security, and hopefully you can get the product that you want with the proper level of security. I think what we will increasingly see is reliance upon uh, third party certifications. So for example, there's a program, uh, joint program between the and US governments, there's a standard called FITS 140-1, where they will actually uh, evaluate the implementations of these cryptographic algorithms. There's another international program uh, referred to as the common criteria that will actually give your software to a third party lab and they look at it. Now these are very costly programs, not so costly for large companies, they're very costly for a very small company. And I think increasingly for the important applications, customers are going to demand that there is some third party evaluation. Just every week you see another number is about a flaw in one of the products. People who are actually relying upon software for business critical applications in technology that so they load vendors that don't have that issue. The market pressure will basically demand uh, you know, call the shift towards vendors that are security. We're going to change the size of the positive numbers you Right, so the question is, has there been a change in the size of the, uh, basically the key size of the public key certificates? Uh, there has. Um, up until about uh, three or four years ago, it was still quite common to see um, RSA keys at 512 bits. And uh, then there's been a shift down the last couple of years, and almost all the commercial products you can see will be using 1,000 bit RSA. Turns out that uh, not too long ago, uh, an actual um, box standard 512 bit number was factored. So it was down there, enormous computer power. So it was down there, and that basically told everyone, you know, just rely on what they done. It doesn't move to 1,000 bits. Now, the additional security of 1,000 bits over 512 bits. It's not too, it's like, it's much greater. So that, you know, what we can attack goes up like this, and when we go from 5 to 12 to 1,000, it goes up like this, then it's sort of out of reach. Now, we all we have commercial products in the market which support 2,000 bit RSA, and, uh, you know, some people insist on that, and I guess there's another application, I would say 1,000 bits is probably going to be fine for them. The, um, the BlackBerry slide you have there, um, you, you, you're using um, dead encryption, and you mentioned that that's shown to be practical. Uh, uh, the, the slide shows triple deaths. Okay, so what about triple deaths in your day to day? Right, so triple deaths uh, is not, um, it's, it's probably comparable, depending on what model you use to analyze it, to about 117 bits. You actually use three keys. Um, they use a you know, three-stage process. So that's 170, which is well beyond what you have to worry about. I, um, I imagine the reason triple death was used is that death has a very good commercial name, and triple death, everyone is actually quite comfortable with the security. So, there also has been a, there's an advanced encryption standard effort going on in the US government, where they're looking for officially sanctioned death replacement. Welcome to this time, the US government standard block system been uh, recommending triple tests. We want to have a more efficient algorithm, which is perhaps also stronger. And so I think it's expected that, um, is it this summer sometime that uh, they'll announce? Because they're all 15 candidates now to buy the public submissions. And so sometime around the end of the summer, we'll hear about the, the official EDS selection. I think that will become the, the backup of the algorithm that everyone uses. Yeah.
which um, would allow only your hardware to be Right. So the, the question is basically about, uh, for example, downloadable music and different methods for, for paying for this music. And you can imagine that the major record companies and other the movie houses, they did a lot of thought to a lot of different models on basically you know, um, revenue models for how to extract money from people who actually want to listen to their music. And some of these have involved hardware. Um, and of course, that has a traditional cost. Some of them involve, as I mentioned earlier, encrypting it and then only making the key to decrypt it available if you authenticate yourself. Uh, there's a variety of solutions. Well, I guess the key thing, though, is that you, you want to have the, you know, like, after the thing is, you, you, you don't want people to have any access to the encrypted uh, yeah. data. Right. So, so, is there any way of making plain text? of music or whatever, available to one individual and not having them be able to give it to someone else because, of course, the company's going to lose money they can't buy revenue from the second. The, the problem here really is at some point in time, you actually have to have the real music available to play. Like, you might be graded somehow, uh, but it is available on playing music at some point. And if you do make it available, then it's available. Now, you could require hardware and some custom proprietary format so that only this trusted hardware is capable of playing it. But that's a hardware issue. And that's one that some people have to And then you want to make the digital information not available externally somehow. It's a hard problem. Because you want the piece of the base for it to actually see it. Or hear it. Right? So it's a, Probably a hardware solution. What is your biggest fear of security on the internet? What is my biggest fear of security? Um, I would say that I guess my biggest my biggest fear is that people will use products without that they will trust products which they have no reason they should have no reason to trust. So they will just assume that there's security built in when there isn't. And people in our society, we basically, you know, we trust all the products we buy because there's, there's um, you know, good standards in place for automobiles and for appliances that you buy. And the cycle will just kind of trust that it's safe. And every worry it's not. So it's really a huge regulation thing. It's, um, get down to your, uh, don't, you know, ask your name. Ask your name what kind of security they're using. And if they can't explain it to you, they're not going to wish to make it. We'll take one more question. How far off do you see sort of an implementation of a smart card in the future? You go around the center with one card, right? So the question is how far off is the one the smart card solution where you have one smart card for many? I mean, smart cards have been used in Europe for over 10 years. And their digital cellular that's a, what's called a subscriber in any model or a SIM card that is a smart card that's plugging into the phone. And I think having multi-application smart cards, the challenge there is to actually get the cooperation amongst the industry players. So that's not a technical problem at all. It's totally how can you align the industry forces? I mean, that actually is a lot harder. It's not a technical problem, it's a lot harder than you would think. People have to pour money into particular solutions. And uh, nothing's changed. So uh, I guess you, know, you could guess maybe maybe three or five years. Um, really guess. Last question. So the question is, uh, how do you choose between ECC and RSA? Well, there are. So these are two different ways of implementing uh, basically the same functionality. And there's um, strong belief that both are secure. And there's different environments, and there's some trade-offs. So for example, in the current desktop environments um, where RSA is widely deployed, there's not a whole lot of momentum towards shifting to ECC. In a very constrained environment where you're worried about you know, saving every bit and the length of signature, the length of transmission is important.
then currently, like the curve would be advantageous. And I think you really have to look at every application and figure out what's important to you. And these things will change over time. I'd like to thank you once again for your uh, attendance.